You're listening to Toronto's number one real estate podcast, powered by Watson Estates. The most successful local real estate investing starts right here, right now. Here's your host, broker, investor, and social media influencer, Bradley Watson. Good morning, investors. Bradley here. I'm so excited you could join us again this morning for our podcast on Toronto's number one real estate podcast. Before I get jumping into all this, I just want to say thank you to all of our listeners. You guys are doing amazing. The amount of downloads and watches are just blowing my mind. And I just have to thank you guys for supporting our channel. And we're going to continue to put out fantastic content, especially during a time when news needs to come out daily. Some people are publishing content and getting really extreme and coming weekly on their information, but we've realized that we need this stuff to come out daily because the news comes out daily. And in some cases, we're actually able to beat the news. I'll give you a big fat for instance. Just yesterday, I received an email from the Toronto Real Estate Board, and they said that they pretty much sent out their mid-April market watch information to all agents across the city, across the GTA, that are part of their board. The irony is, is they had published a press release the morning before at 5 a.m. So more than 24 hours before they had published it. And luckily, because we had done a daily podcast, you guys got it first, even before the news outlets, because realistically, we turned the sucker around in four or five hours. So you guys heard about these things first. And this was no small press release. This was amazing information. We're going to cover some of that today in our podcast as well, just as a bit of a recap and also from a different perspective, which I love. As we kind of digest these topics and new opinions come through, we start to get a bigger, broader picture, and it gives us a little bit better of a position on understanding where our market stands today. But to cover some of the subjects I wanted to dive into, I want to start off by talking about our emergency benefits and what we have here in Ontario. And across my radar this morning, come whipping past me, and I just had to do a double take, that there are benefits going out in BC right now that I think are something that we could potentially be looking at in Ontario that maybe we've missed. I don't know about you guys, but this is the first I'm hearing about it. I wanted to share it with you because it gives a new and interesting perspective. Then I want to talk about how will Toronto's real estate industry look post COVID-19. This is a very popular article right now. It's probably the number one searched article over the last 24 hours. I want to dive into what they're saying. But the funny thing is that article does not do a whole lot. I actually found one that's even better. And I want to jump into that and gives a lot more clarity. And I love it. I'm so excited to share it with you. And then finally, what will reopening Ontario look like? And the lucky thing is, is we've got a scapegoat, and that is Saskatchewan, and they're starting to try something a little funny. And with that going on, we can actually get a better picture of what some of the services would be like if and when Ontario decides to ever open our doors for business. And of course, timelines are still up in the air, but I can't wait to dive into what that could look like. All right, so let's jump right into it. And if you're not already subscribing, make sure you do. I'm so uh, I'm so excited that we're just doing so well. I'm I'm noticing our podcasts are actually outperforming in some ways our YouTube videos, which we've been doing for years. So very cool. All right. So this article comes from the T T Y E E, and it's called Canada's housing S- system is cracking under the crisis. Renters are asking why they should pay their landlords, while landlords fear losing their own housing. Now, I'm not going to jump into that article, and I'm going to tell you why. I started reading that article, and there was nothing new in there. But one thing that it tipped me off of is because this was a BC article, is they were talking about this BC emergency benefit for workers. And I'm like, well, what the heck is that? Because I know about the Canadian benefit, the Canadian emergency benefit. I know about EI and what's being given out. But what is going on in BC? And so I went on to the BC official website, the government website, and this was updated as of today. And this is what it says. The BC emergency benefit for workers will provide a tax-free one-time $1,000 payment for BC residents whose ability to work has been affected due to COVID-19. This sounds very similar to the CERB. To be eligible, you must have a resident, be a resident of British Columbia as of March 15th, meet the eligible requirements of the CERB, have been approved for the CERB, Even if you haven't received a federal benefit payment yet, be at least 15 years old, have filed or agreed to file your 2019 income tax return, and not be receiving provincial income assistance or disability assistance. So this is news to me. This is not brand new information. So you guys might have heard this. In fact, they mentioned doing this back in March. I don't know when this was announced. However, the payments are starting right now. Like they're just starting, I think it's tomorrow in the next day or so. These things are rolling out, these payments. And so very interesting stuff. And um, I'm just... 
I don't know. I'm floored by it because you know what? I, I'm aware of our Canadian government giving money out, but now we're seeing provinces doing it. And as I continue down, and probably the reason I'm like, I have to say this in our podcast was because as I scroll down the page, I saw another heading called temporary rent supplement. And so it says this, a temporary rent supplement is available. Eligible households with dependents can receive up to $500 per month. Eligible households without dependents can receive up to $300 per month. The supplement is paid directly to landlords. Applications for the supplement are open to the BC Housing website, on the BC Housing website. Okay, and so as soon as I saw that, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe we're not doing a good enough job. And by say we, I mean myself. Maybe I should be looking a little bit more what other provinces are doing because clearly they're not doing it the same way. I guess it was a bit of an assumption or that the news would be a little bit louder that different provinces are doing different things. And I'm usually pretty good at catching what BC is doing because their housing market is so similar to ours. But what this says to me is it pretty much puts it back on the table and reinforces our thinking of maybe there's more money here that could be coming in the form of benefits in our province. Now, again, they were talking about this back in March. This isn't new, but our BC market in, in you know, mainland Vancouver and, and versus Toronto, there's very similar. And so I can see this possibly playing out. But then on the rent side, the rent relief side, I was talking about this a few days ago, as you guys know. And so now I'm hearing that this is happening. This isn't just people yelling. This is actually taking pace. It's not, I mean, to the same caliber that we thought people have been arguing for. People have been calling for $2,500. But there is money being given up to $500 per month if you have dependents in your home for rent. And it goes straight to the landlords, which, again, removes a lot of the feud and helps protect small mom and pop landlords. So, Guys, don't write off the information we've given in the last few days. This should reinforce it. Maybe something can happen. We're getting pretty close to the end of April, so it might not happen this week, especially because I'm not hearing any whispers from government officials, but it has happened in other provinces, and so stay tuned because you never know. Rent relief could be on its way, which would be amazing news for landlords and tenants. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight there. I know that. I learned something new reading that this morning. But I want to jump into two articles, and I'm actually going to go backwards here from how I have it in my notes, because I want to start off with the post-COVID article. So the article is from torontostories.com. It's a very popular article right now. If you type Toronto real estate news, I think it's number one. What will Toronto's real estate industry look like in a post-COVID world? So I read through this article. It says, it start off with, federal, provincial, and local governments all hesitating to deliver an end date for when current measures could be lifted. It's still hard to imagine what life post COVID-19 would look like, which is funny because there's a, that's actually not even true anymore because now of what Saskatchewan is doing, which we'll cover in a minute. From a real estate standpoint, could we see the market crash? Some experts say that's unlikely, but the rising unemployment rate, which included the loss of 1 million jobs in March and many more Canadians fearing they'll be out of work in April, combined with the slowing economy, are cause for serious concern. What I do like about Toronto Stories, I've, I've done a few articles on them recently. They I like that they're a very balanced approach to their articles they seem to be fair um, but i went on to read this article and they're pretty much it's a bit of an interview with a bunch of realtors and so they asked them the question which raises concern what will the real estate industry look like post covid19 particularly here in toronto and out of the answers i skimmed through and i'll summarize for you three of them replied that the answer is technology and they said something like this creativity and innovation will be the natural outcome some signs of creativity Creativity already taking place with buyers, sellers, and agents turning towards virtual and 3D home tours to get eyes on listings as physical distancing measures and the cancellation of open houses remain in place. So pretty much all of the online virtual tours and the online open houses that you're seeing will continue, which is kind of funny. I'm like, why would you interview three agents to get the same like you've got a good enough quote? The article is a little too long, but we're reinforcing it, I suppose. It says an innovative way to highlight a property is through live streaming open houses. Potential buyers can log on to a stream via Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, and get an in-depth tour with a listing agent while interacting and asking poor questions. We talked about this probably last week now. This is old news in my book. I mean, maybe I'm getting a little bit stubborn here because we've been doing it so frequently. But this is still recent, I suppose, in the grand scheme of things. Things do tend to move a little bit slower. And so, yeah, I agree. I do agree. Of course, it's innovative ways. But as you guys know from my opinion pieces that I've done in the past, technology, I don't think, is a cause for replacement. And I don't think we're going to even see – we've seen traffic increase, but I don't think you're going to see it really doing any 
serious good for improving the number of transactions that are happening. It's, I just don't think it's going to be the lifesaver that we all think it is. There's been the virtual tours, there's been pictures in the past. I mean, I think it's now just a requirement. It's not necessarily just a brownie points if you've got it and you can set your listing apart. I think you have to have it if you're going to put your listing up today. But there is some other stuff in here, which is why I brought up the article. They talked about brokerage doing things electronically. It's actually a good point. I've never mentioned this, but it's happening in our brokerage as well. The quote here is at Umber, which is the brokerage talking here. We have fully stopped the use of checks and all exchanges of money are now by electronic means. This is something we have been pushing to change for years, but is now forcing other brokerages into the change. Oh, thank goodness for you guys. I love following you guys. This is amazing. That's just, I'm just kidding. We've, we actually applied this to, this is by necessity. Our front door is closed to walk in business. We have offices available for people. I, at least last I checked, they might close it. I don't work from the office because I work from home, my home office. But for those who do go into the office, my understanding is their offices are still open. They're just kind of in their own little isolation. But for people walking on the street to deliver a check, that's been closed for before this was an emergency. This is not like everybody responding all of a sudden to this. This has been going on for a while. And you've been able to, this is true, you have been able to do electronic transfers for things like deposit checks and exchanges of money online. It's just nobody's really done it. I've done it in businesses where I've had clients that are purchasing further away. Maybe they're buying a, an hour out and who wants to be driving a check for an hour when we can just find a local branch and deposit it. And I think now people are starting to get the hint that that's a possible thing to do. And I mean, at the end of the day, our business is kind of an old school thinking, right? It's get connected with people, spend some time, don't run in and out of the bank and drop your check. Why don't you go spend some time, chat with them, see what the market's doing, see if there's any listings. That's kind of been the environment, at least until recently. And now all of a sudden people are forced to change. They also talk about how real estate associations and boards at all levels have adapted and changed, which is true. Things like the live open house, which is on MLS, which we've just kind of mentioned. And moving forward, this is their kind of, again, this is crazy to me that this is the top article right now because it is it is good information, but it's not as good as the one we're gonna cover in a second. So this person says there's gonna be two camps for realtors. In the first camp, you're gonna have agents who will go back to the way they traditionally did business. I agree with that. And the second group of agents will notice the benefits of utilizing technology and implement it to their real estate businesses. I agree with that. I, I think that was already the case, personally. There was already two camps. I think some people are being forced into the second camp, but I also think that because of the standstill now that we have in our marketplace, and I apologize, this article didn't talk about our market. We're gonna talk about it in a second. But because of everything that's going on, I think people are either forced to move, but I think most people are just kind of sitting in their current seats. I don't even think people are jumping. I haven't used a virtual open house because like, I don't, I don't even know if I see benefits of open house. I guess I could try it out, see how it goes, but I wouldn't be in any rush to throw that up. I just think that's a, a makeshift with the amount of exposure people are already getting with our listings on social media. What do we need to open house to do an open house for? It just creates a bit of laziness out there, especially if you've got such a strong virtual tour. Anyways, I can see this being limited to two people at a time, but if groups are, so then they talk, they go on to pretty much say, we're going to keep groups to a moderate, but they actually say that they don't think that there's going to be any serious enforcement. Let me tell you guys how they get these people, by the way, the, the realtors that they have on here. Sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, you're so famous. You talk in the news. I, I've got friends, good friends of mine that I've done kind of collaborated with and, and talked to and follow closely that are in the news. And I've talked to them and they're like, they don't think it's as exciting as you do. It seems all glamorous, but they've just somehow connected through their brokerage in some cases. But I also know there are websites you can go on and submit your quotes. So often what you've got is people in some cases that aren't overly busy putting in these articles because they're sitting at home doing nothing else and sending them into news articles and they're able to publish and get into articles like that and all of a sudden become super famous and show it with all their friends. But there is one guy that we're going to talk about in a second who's publishing an article and he is the head honcho as far as I can tell in the news. His name is John Pasalis. He is from Realosophy. You've probably seen him in the news and he actually does, and this is the first time I'm picking this up as we've been doing these podcasts, but he did an article that is a little delayed as far as the stats, but he did a really good job of analysis, which now I can see why they pick him up in the major news outlets. He's, he's really good. And it says, is Toronto's real estate market stabilizing? This, in my opinion, is the type of article that should be the first article people are seeing. But again, a lot of people, 
that listen to our podcast, a lot of our listeners are investors or people that are a little more savvy or interested generally of learning about the industry. Out in the news, people just want to know, give me the highlights, you know, give me something quick, give me something to chew on, which people are more than happy to give you the good side or the bad side, depending on the channels you listen to. Whereas someone like this and and the people who listen to us, what they're craving is more detail, where their opportunities. And, and so that's what I love about this article. So I'm going to give you some of what I, what I highlight, which is quite a chunk, but it's really good stuff. So follow along. Home sale numbers continue to be down across Toronto and the GTA, but an equal drop in new homes for sale appear to be keeping prices stable. This is what we talked about two days ago when that mid-April report came out. Toronto's housing market continues to see big declines in both sales and new listings. But this downward trend did show signs of stabilizing this past week. And this is what he says. Looking at the number of sales, they were down 71 over last year, very similar to a 73 decline that we saw last week. New listings are down 64% over last year, which is the same rate of decline as last week. But there are signs of stability. The MOI is what he talks about. The months of inventory, which he, he explains here, is calculated by taking the number of homes available for sale, dividing it by the number of homes sold over the past 30 days. So if there were 1,000 homes for sale and 500 have sold, the months of inventory would be two because it takes two months for that home to sell, to turn over in, in this market. The GTA has roughly four months of inventory right now. And typically months of inventory, he explains, which is true. I usually say about five. So he's saying in the same range, four to six sits as your months of inventory is considered a balanced market. And it doesn't favor either the buyer or the seller. When we have a month's inventory of one, like we just had over a month ago, that is typically a very competitive market favoring sellers with house prices rapidly growing. Conversely, when you have eight to 10 months of inventory, there's a lot of homes in the market for sale and you can choose from and usually puts downward pressure on prices. When our quote speedometer is between four to six, prices are usually flat. When it's between when it's below four, prices start to increase and above six usually leads to a decline. But more important than knowing the MOI, is at any given point in time is understanding how it is changing over time, how we're speeding up, slowing down or on cruise control. This is true. And this is what everyone's trying to gauge, right? This is why we want information in this article. They say weekly and my thoughts daily is what is, how are we gauging that? Because this is, this is good stuff. This is us really chewing this information and coming out with something quite beautiful and getting a good picture. So what he said here is for the first two months of the year, the market was picking up steam. Then the months of inventory fell from two months to one month. And by the end of February, home prices were rising by 17% per year. You ever wonder, we've hinted at this before, why prices have gone up and they've gone down, but yet somehow they haven't really crashed. Even though we've had price declines, they still seem to be somewhat flat. This is because we saw 17 per year in February, according to this article. So the growth was so high that now we have some room to lose and still be kind of not really that affected. When this happens, it's like the housing market is hitting on the gas pedal, which pushes prices even higher. Then in the third mark week of March, which is kind of when everything started, when the government of Ontario declared a state of emergency, the market started to hit the brakes. And we can see that with the increase in inventory going from under one month to four months in a very short period. So this is where we're at now, right? In a matter of a month, everything just shut off the brakes. The question is, where did we land? One of our fears when housing markets are cooling down rapidly like this is that months of inventory of four may become six, eight, or 10. And if this happens, we get a lot of downward pressure on prices. When people are saying I'm nervous about home prices, this is what they're saying, but they don't know that this is how it's calculated. They don't see the numbers behind it. But as of last week, this didn't happen. The months of inventory dipped slightly, but more importantly, staying around four months. So guys, we are seem to be flattening at a point where it's more of the actually the early stages in some cases of a balanced market. So at this point, I wouldn't be freaking out. Of course, we're going to keep our finger on the pulse here. We're going to keep giving that information because it's coming out constantly. But as of right now, we're sitting pretty stable, and this is why everyone's just coasting. This is why I think when you're sitting two types of realtors, the ones that are going to be using technology, the ones that aren't, that's why I think there's a comfort level of staying in your camp and not really switching, even now, even when this is the moment you would have to in order to survive in this business. So that gives you some highlights, and if you haven't listened to any of these things, make sure you go back and listen to our podcast about our mid-April report. It was really good stuff, really, really good information. And I want to transition along here and get into a topic that I announced I'd be following yesterday and new new information. I don't like saying new news, but there you go. I just said it anyways. Has come out of Saskatchewan. This is, I think, really big info because Saskatchewan is the first scapegoat 
in Canada. It's so difficult. Like there is this balance and we've seen we've seen in the last few days even articles and controversy on whether we should open our economy in place of quote lives, right? Like we're going to open the doors and people are just going to they're going to die by the thousands. Okay. There I get that side, but there is a a huge cost to being in isolation and to having an economy falling apart. And I'm not even going to get into all those, but I mean that's a that is a uh, rabbit hole of information in itself and what is the causes and there's not even been fully quantified of people being in isolation there's real challenges with that too so and at the end of the day i am a business person i am typically my my political views tend to lean to the right and so i see that there is a need for our economy i don't want to be sitting on everybody collecting emergency benefits i don't want that to be the case this is an emergency and it should only be treated like that for a short period of time and so now who wants to be the first sucker, the first premier that comes out and says, we're going to open our doors. We're going to start unlocking everything and we're going to see what happens and we're going to gauge it. No one wants to do that, or at least they don't want to be first. And so now we have our first. The Band-Aid is ripped off. The question is, is who comes next? And of course, it's come from Saskatchewan. This article is called, it's from cbc.ca, COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, five-phase plan to reopen the province set to begin May 4th. That's very soon. And the Saskatchewan government's five-phase plan to reopen the province is set to begin on May 4th. The plan, which was unveiled Thursday by Premier Scott Moen, Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab, will guide the province as it restarts the economy during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Over the next several weeks, as a quote, restrictions will be gradually lifted by adding more types of businesses to the allowable business list, meaning that they can reopen if they so choose. The articles that I've seen, there was one in from the Star, I didn't even spend much attention to it because what it was pretty much saying is this is what our experts say will unlock as far as the number of businesses and who would open first and so there's a lot of speculation the premier hasn't even announced it in ontario but why i like this article is we are seeing an active calendar being placed yes it's not in ontario but businesses are not going to be all that different right if a nail salon opens it's okay to open in saskatchewan it's okay to open in ontario and so this is the first picture in my opinion the first clear picture because it now is in collaboration with the leaders and with the health officials all businesses and public venues will be required to continue following physical distances and cleaning and disinfecting practices to protect both employees and customers. Members of the public will be expected to follow physical distancing rules and to stay home if they're experiencing any COVID-19 symptoms. Guys, we're not just opening the border or we're not just opening, I keep saying border, we're not just opening doors and letting people run out on the streets and just coughing on each other. There's still going to be physical distancing in place. And this is clearly said here. So, you know what, I'm just going to get to the get to the good stuff. Let's jump right down to it. If we find that these cases aggressively traced or traced back to one particular business or suite of businesses, we'll look at honing in very closely on that particular business or these particular businesses in that sector to ensure that we are doing everything to keep Saskatchewan residents safe. So here's the deal. We're going to let you run, but we're going to hold a big fat shotgun. And if you run in the wrong direction or you go and you start touching other people and coughing on other people, I'm going to I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to pull you back and your industry is going to have to wait in line here. So don't don't screw yourself. So here's the five phases. OK, phase one set out beginning May 4th. They're going to have things like certain medical services along with outdoor recreation. I I love going outside. Even now, outdoor recreation is very important and it's very low risk. Medical services, including dentistry, optometry, physical therapy, opticians, podiatry, occupational therapy, chiropractic treatment, facilities to accommodate low risk outdoor activities like boating, fishing, online reservations for campgrounds, which are then to be opened on June 1st. My, I feel bad because we have a youth program through our church that I volunteer with. In fact, Thursday evenings, we connected with them online. And we, every, every at the end of every school year, we have this giant event it's like a a camping event that we host and that has been pretty much called off now i believe it's kind of around that june 1st so hopefully we're able to make up it to these poor kids that just lost out especially if they're in grade 12 and this is their last chance to experience this thing and they're all getting pushed back and uh, hopefully this allows for that to be opened up and we can kind of do something later for them but golf courses will reopen with restrictions beginning may 15th so that's your first phase phase two will begin on may 19th That will include retail businesses and personal services. For example, clothing stores, sporting goods stores, vaping supply shops, um, bookstores, jewelry stores, boat and ATV dealerships, accessory stores, music stores, electronic stores, pawn shops, travel agencies, personal services like hairdressing. So that's where you can get your hair cut. So 
don't grow too fast. We're going to, if you live in Saskatchewan, if you live in Ontario, just, just get it. It just give up. Just, you know, just go get that shaver. Just shave it all off. It's too, we're, we're, we're going to be waiting past May 19th in Ontario. Massage, uh, massage therapists, acupuncturists, et cetera. And that's going to be phase two, phase three, um, estheticians, tattoo artists, cosmetologists. So pretty much this is remaining personal services and relaxing of public gatherings. So like gyms, restaurants, food services, childcare centers. Now here's the thing that doesn't have a date. This is going to be, this is a first phase without date licensed establishments and limits on public gatherings will increase to 15 people. Phase four also without a date would be casinos, bingo halls. This is just getting bigger and bigger municipal parks, swimming pools, playgrounds, movie theaters, museums. Once this starts going up, we are mostly there guys. Seasonal programming such as camps, recreational activities, and athletic activities limits on public gatherings will increase to 30 people. And phase five, the good old long-term care facilities. And oh, do they even have that here? No, dependent on factors, lifting of long-term restrictions. So I would think you're going to have pretty much the rest would fall under phase five that weren't kind of mentioned there. So this is the very first time. Oh, man, here we go. We got a whole bunch more stuff here. I am not... What do we got here? Small gatherings. Okay, I'm not going to dive into this, but I'm going to share one thing right now that's affecting us because I want you guys to realize that we're all kind of facing something too. And I'm going to share with you what we're facing right now. As part of our youth, I was chatting with some of the leaders. One of them is a nurse at our local hospital. And they're saying right now that nurses are, they're pretty much being forced to work overtime here on on women. Now I've got I've got my wife having a baby in June. And apparently you're allowed to have a support person in delivery. And that's the one time you can take your mask off and, you know, do what women do when they're pushing a baby out. Probably just like, you know, laughing and giggling, whatever. And however, on the postpartum side, you're not allowed a support person right now. And they're working because what's happening is the nurses are having to do everything. And of course, I'm sure the women aren't so excited about not having a support person there with them. I know we're not going to be very excited if that's still the case in June, but there is a lot of restrictions. And so trying to figure all this out matters. It matters for real estate because we want to make sure businesses are open and people aren't losing their jobs. And this isn't creating a long-term crisis or issue. We're already seeing a number of really large businesses and restaurants and retailers closing all around us. And we don't want that to keep happening. So I'm rooting for it just as much as you guys. I want things to open up and I don't want us to get kind of caught in this mindset of, oh, we got to make sure that this thing is completely removed before we open the doors. Because if we take that attitude, then we're not going to be opening our doors. Maybe ever. We don't know how long this thing's going to last. There's still too many question marks. This has been another great podcast. I'm so happy you guys could join us on Toronto's number one real estate podcast. We're number one on Google podcast right now. If you want to search us out, go for it. Leave us a review if you're following us on iTunes, because unfortunately they go based on ratings and reviews. So we don't pop up at nearly to the top. But in my opinion, this is the best information you're going to get, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and all the lockdowns and emergencies as it relates to the Toronto real estate market. So do us a favor, jump over there, give us a five stars. I appreciate all you guys. Every single day I'm seeing our listener count rising and rising and rising. And uh, I don't know if this is going to be a curve, but I'm kind of hoping that in this case, this isn't a curve and that it continues because I think that this information is important. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will see you guys again tomorrow with more and have yourself a great day. Take care and keep it real.